Hi, Artemis Paint here. This is the first video in a series on how I read horse racing markets. I do most of my trading in the last two minutes before the start of a race. During this time, the market has a clear direction. It has a specific goal that it wants to reach. This goal is probably the same in all horse races. This may also apply to other sports. Understanding what the market is trying to do is the first step in reading the market. There's more work involved before you can take advantage of this knowledge. However, in this video, I will explain what the market's goal is. This video is a sports trading video. Sports trading is gambling and I'm not giving any advice in this video, I'm just giving my opinions. This video is a part one for reading horse racing markets. When I started making this video, I intended to make one video on reading markets. However, as I started creating the video, I realised that I had too much stuff to explain to fit into a single video. There are parts of this video when I say that I'll explain something in more detail later in the video. In a small number of cases, the explanation might not be in this video, but it will be in part two of this series of videos. This is because when I decided to divide the video into parts, I'd already done a lot of the audio and I didn't want to go through the video and re-record stuff. So, I'll tell you what you will get in this video. Firstly, I'll explain the difference between, between a big picture view of the market and the small picture view. The gurus teach you the small picture view. The small picture is useful, however, the big picture is more important. Secondly, I'll break the market down. I'll discuss what the market is, who the players are in the market, and what their roles are. Thirdly, I'll explain what the goal of the market is. The market does have a specific goal. Understanding this goal is the first step towards seeing the big picture. In order to put this information to use, you will need to learn to read form and read the betting. I'll make videos covering these skills later. These skills are not particularly difficult to learn. The most difficult part of trading on horse racing is finding out what you need to learn. There's a lot of information that you can use to help your trading. Most of the information is outside the ladder. Once you have this information, you still have to put it together, make sense of it, and formulate a plan. You may have noticed that there's a poker table on your screen. And you might be wondering what a poker table is doing in a trading video. I used to play poker and my trading strategies are derived from a combination of what I learnt playing poker and what I learnt during my punter days. Strictly speaking, I'm still a punter because I do sometimes have a bet. Throughout this video series, I'll use some basic poker concepts as analogies to explain certain trading strategies. You don't need to know anything about poker strategy. I'll only be using the most basic of poker concepts. So let's start with this analogy. Imagine you're watching a game of poker between two players. You can trade on which player you think will win the hand. So there's a ladder with odds on it. And let's say this ladder represents the button's odds. If you wanted to trade on this hand, what information do you have? The answer is you don't have any real information. The only information available to you are the movements of the odds. Therefore, the only strategy available to you is to chase the odds as they move around. However, what if you could see one of the button's hole cards? 
In this case, you can see an ace, which makes the button a favourite against a random hand. Wouldn't seeing just one whole card give you an advantage over the trader who couldn't see any whole cards? The poker players themselves can see two cards. If they were playing on the ladder, they would have an information advantage over everyone. The point is that both poker and trading are games of incomplete information. And when you have more information than other players, you have an advantage. And when you have less information, you have a disadvantage. Let's look at how this translates into the trading horse racing scenario. There are three levels of information. The stable staff, horse racing owners and other connections have inside information. They know their horse and they know how well it's likely to run today. This is equivalent to seeing a whole hand in poker. The bookmakers have even more information. They probably have connections with various stables through which they can get information on more than one horse in the race. The form reading traders can see the form. However, they don't have inside stable information. Therefore, form readers have less information than stable staff. So form readers have the equivalent of seeing one card of the poker hands. The guru trained traders are taught that they don't need to read form. These traders have the least knowledge because they don't read form and they don't have inside stable information. This is equivalent to seeing no cards. The students of gurus base their trades on the movements of odds during the last five minutes before a race. And since everyone can see the movements of odds, these traders don't have any knowledge that anyone else doesn't always have access to. Reading the market solely by looking at the odds is difficult. If you open a race in the ladder with no prior knowledge of the race, you've left reading the market too late. In this case, a lot of traders end up chasing odds around. I'll explain why it's difficult to read most markets solely by looking at the odds. Let's say a trader thinks that a horse's odds are going to drift. He puts his trade in and the odds go a few ticks in his favour. Next, the odds come down by a few ticks. What should he do now? The same question can be asked when he puts a trade in and the odds go against him slightly. What should he do? The answer is that he doesn't have a clue. The odds looked as if they would go in a direction. In the first example, they did go in that direction. Then they reversed, which means that the odds looked as if they were changing direction. There are two main issues with the trader's behaviour. Firstly, he doesn't have a long-term view of the direction that the odds will go in. This results in headless chicken-like behaviour with the trader chasing odds all over the place. It's the difference between seeing the small picture and the big picture. The small picture is what you see on the ladder. For example, you might lay a horse because its odds have come down and they seem to have slowed down. The small picture answers the question, is this the right time to enter a trade? The big picture answer the, answers the question, does my trade have the right long-term direction? The big picture gives you a long-term direction. It gives you an opinion whether you think the odds are too long or too short. And you can afford to make mistakes with the small picture. If you get your entry point wrong, you don't always lose. And often when the odds go against you, they'll come back and you can scratch the trade. However, if you're often getting the, the big picture wrong, that is the long-term direction, if you're getting that wrong, you won't have any confidence in your decisions. Therefore, you might green up too early or not green up when you should. And when the trade goes against you, you won't know whether to wait or close the trade. The problem with making short-term decisions solely on market movements is that you don't know whether the change in the odds is random. Therefore, you don't have a real reason to believe that the odds will continue in the same direction or reverse. 
Secondly, we should aim to explain our trading decisions in terms of the sport. I'll use a football analogy. Let's say Leicester City are playing. When the team sheets come out, Jamie Vardy isn't playing. Just in case you don't know, Jamie Vardy is an important player for Leicester. If he's not, play, if he's not playing, the odds for Leicester will all, almost always drift. In this situation, traders are likely to lay Leicester as soon as they see that Vardy is not on the team sheets. The point I'm trying to make is that if you ask a trader why he laid Leicester in this situation, he would say that it was because Vardy was, wasn't on the team sheet. He won't explain it in terms of resistance points, advanced charts or any other superstitious nonsense. He will explain it in terms of the sports. And it's okay to avoid walking under ladders when you're out and about. However, if you're superstitious on a trading ladder, you're likely to create an unhappy destiny. I base my trading on theories. Theories are different from superstition. Theories are based on logic or evidence, while superstitions are just made up nonsense. Although theories aren't proven, a good theory can help us to make good trading decisions. So, I want to discuss the betting and the players in the market. As I've said, it's difficult to win by just looking at the betting. It's also difficult to win by just looking at form. It's not as straightforward as back horses with good form and lay horses with bad form. Our aim is to interpret the betting by referring to the form. In other words, we want to connect the betting with the form to reach conclusions about what is going on. The idea of playing the player comes from poker. There are three aspects of playing the player. The first is understanding who your opponents are. The second is to understand what their tendencies are. Different poker players bet their hands differently. For example, some players will bet their strong hands strongly and play timidly with their weak hands, and you have others that bet their weak hands strongly because they want their opponent to fold, and these same players may act as if they are weak when they have a strong hand because they want their opponent to bet the hand for them and because they're scared that their opponent will fold if they bet. These are beginners I'm talking about. As players learn the game, they start to mix up how they play their hand to prevent other players from getting a read on them. Stables also have betting patterns. Some are straightforward, others appear to go out of their way to set up a gamble. Some stables are more prone to the odds of a well back favourite bouncing back, and others are more aggressive when they back their favourites. Unlike poker players who learn to mix up their play, stables tend to be consistent in the way that they bet their horses. Thirdly, once you identify a betting pattern, you have to figure out how to exploit the other player's tendencies. So, let's look at the different types of players in the trading market. So, the market is not a single giant machine. You may hear gurus say things like, the market's ruthless and the market doesn't care. Not only does this give the impression that the market is a single entity, but it also gives the impression that the market is psychopathological. We want to look at reality. The market is neutral. If you're consistently losing money, it means that you're making too many mistakes. When we enter the market, we usually enter with a one-tick disadvantage and we have to pay commission on winnings. This isn't a huge disadvantage to overcome. If we can identify the groups that make up the market, we may have a better chance of overcoming our disadvantage. The market is made up of groups of people. I've broken the market down into stables, punters, traders and bookmakers. Each group has its own purpose within the market. So let's look at these groups and their possible roles in the market. Firstly, there's stable money. 
By stable money, I mean money bet by anyone connected to the horse, such as trainers, stable staff and owners of horses. Stable money is likely to have a bigger influence in weak markets than in strong markets. For example, the betting for a super strong market such as the Cheltenham Festival is likely to have money being bet from a lot of different sources. In addition, at Cheltenham, everyone's trying to win and a lot of stables will fancy their horses to win. Therefore, the effect of stable money might become more diluted in strong markets and high-class events. In most horse racing markets, the class of races tends to be low and the markets are weak. Therefore, stable money is likely to be a dominating force in these markets. Owners buy horses for these types of races because they want to gamble. The prize money probably doesn't pay the training costs of the horse and there isn't a lot of prestige to be gained by winning a low-class race. Therefore, there is a lot of stable connection gambling going on. It's important to understand that the money being bet by stables and connections is likely to be a lot more than most people imagine. In addition, where there's big money being bet, there's likely to be intelligence involved. In other words, the stables are not thinking that I think my horse will win and therefore I'll back it at any odds. They probably have an accurate range of the value odds of their own horse. What I'm getting at is that stables may not be betting in the way that we think. Here's an example. Imagine you have a horse. You think its value above 3.0. You don't think its value below 2.5. In fact, you think it's minus EV below 2.5. And in between 2.5 and 3.0, you're not sure whether it's value or not. Now, most of us think that stables back horses and allow the horse to run. However, wouldn't the stable get more value if they back the horse when its odds rise significantly above 3.0 and lay it when its odds fall significantly below 2.5? The answer to that is yes. What's more, a stable can back and lay at value prices all day until the start of the race. The reality is that more information can come in as the day goes on and the stable may change their opinion about their own horse. For example, if the stable sees another horse in the race getting heavily backed and this was unexpected, the stable may start to doubt their original opinion of the value of the odds that they assigned to their own horse. And this isn't even mathematical ro rocket science. As I've said, I have the occasional bet and there have been occasions where I backed a horse at around 3.0 and the horse has been backed to an odds-on price. Let's say it gets back to 1.9. When this happens, I ask myself, if I didn't already have a bet on, would I ever back this horse at 1.9? And if the answer is not in a million years, I turn my punt into a trade and take the money. And the winnings from the trade are small compared to the winnings that I would get if the horse runs and wins. However, sometimes the horse will run and lose. It's not about the total amount of money that I can potentially win, it's about value. When turning a punt into a trade, it's about backing at value odds and laying at value odds and not just laying because I'm in profit. And if I can figure this out, I'm sure the big stable punters can as well. As traders, we don't usually have such accurate information. As a form reader, I don't have a clear idea of the real value of the favourite in most races. However, we can use the information that we have to get reasonably close to finding good spots to trade in. The reason that I've coloured the stables and bookmakers in red is because they're not going to be that different from each other on how they think about gambling. In addition, information from stables is likely to move markets early in the day. You might think that stables keep their information secret. Some might, however, others might not. 
Stable information is valuable to bookmakers, therefore there could be mutually beneficial relationships between stables and bookmakers whereby information is shared. Some of you might be wondering how we can separate stable money from punter money when we're looking at the betting. The answer is, often you can't, but very often you can, and I'll deal with this question later in the video. Secondly, there are punters. When we're trading, we need to get into the average punter's mind and think about how an average punter will view a race. We're not trying to get into the mind of a professional punter who looks for value bets at long odds. It would be too difficult and time-consuming to try and find those types of horses anyway. There are different types of punters. The two types of interest are the short-price favourite backer and the follow-the-money backer. The short price favourite backer doesn't just back any old short price favourite. This punter is likely to be a form reader, and this is one reason why we need to read form. We need to predict which horses that the punters are likely to back. Almost all types of punter are trainer aware. This means that their judgement on a horse will also be swayed by whether a trainer is well known and whether the trainer's horses are on form. They will back lesser known trainer's horses if the trainer is in excellent form or if the horse, horse has ex excellent form. Punter money has the potential to push the odds out of their real range. I'm not saying that all punters aren't aware of value, however many are not, and this, is, uh, this applies especially to the follow the money punters. In any case, where there are punters, there are often good trading opportunities. Thirdly, there are traders. Since most traders lose, we should feel comfortable getting involved in races with other traders. I've heard people say that 95% of traders lose. Although the winning traders probably play for higher stakes than the losing traders, it's likely that, in total, the 95% lose more money than the 5% win. Typical traders are looking to cash in on late gambles and bounce backs. Just in case you don't know, in markets, you will often see a drifting favourite getting heavily backed just after the two-minute pre-race mark. I call this a late gamble. Alternatively, you might see a backed favourite's odds bouncing back after the two-minute pre-race mark. I look for late gambles and bounce backs myself. The idea is to predict good spots and get in early. Finding good opportunities takes a lot more knowledge than just thinking the odds are too low or too, or too high without knowing anything about the horse or the market. Fourthly, there are bookmakers. You'll often hear gurus say that bookmakers dump their liability into the exchange markets. This idea of dumping liability is derived from the small bookmaker who's running scared because he's laid too much money on a horse. I don't think this is correct in relation to the modern big bookmakers. Mathematically, the bookmakers can't dump liability into the exchanges profitably. If they've taken too much money on a horse, the odds on that horse will have shortened. If they back the horse to get rid of their liability, they'll be backing a horse at shorter odds than they laid it. The kind of money that a bookmaker would need to bet in order to dump their liability would push the odds down even further. Back in the day, I used to watch Channel 4 Racing, on days that most of the favourites won, I can remember the racing pundit John McCrurick saying that the bookies have lost a massive amount of money. At the time, I thought, like most people, that the bookies never lose. However, if John McCrurick was right, it means that the bookies do not run a mathematically perfect book. If the bookies have given bad odds to punters, the bookies have got the value and they have enough money behind them to allow the horse to run. 
What I'm getting at is that the book, bookmakers can handle big losses and losing runs. The idea is similar to a roulette wheel. A casino can afford to lose money on a single spin of a roulette wheel. For example, on a single spin, if more people have bet on red than black, and red comes up, the casino will lose. Are the casino owners sweating when there's more money on one colour than the other? I doubt it. The casino owners know that they have the odds in their favour and therefore they will win in the long run. Similarly, the big bookmakers have the odds in their favour. The correct odds of a horse aren't as clear as the odds of an outcome on a roulette wheel. Bookmakers can make mistakes with the odds on a horse race. However, just like the casino, the bookmakers know that, in the long term, they are giving themselves positive equity and giving the punters negative equity. Therefore, despite the bookmakers occasionally making a mistake with the odds, in the long term, the punters make a lot more mistakes. Therefore, the bookmakers know that they'll win in the long run. They might lose money on a single race or even over a day's racing if all the favourites win. However, over time, they know that they will win if they keep giving bad value to punters. We can't know for certain what a bookmaker does. However, we can try and put ourselves in the book, big bookmaker's shoes. We could work out how we would maximise profits if we were in their shoes. I'll make two assumptions. Firstly, the bookmakers have enough money to handle losses and therefore they don't need a perfect book. They can just take value wherever they find it. And this has already been addressed. Secondly, just like some stables, the bookmakers know, within a range, the real value of each horse in a race. I'm assuming that the bookmakers have state-of-the-art technology to work out the approximate real odds of each horse. In addition, I'm assuming that they have an, an excellent information network whereby they can obtain information on how most of the horses are expected to run today. So let's have a look at some of the activities that bookmakers can get involved in. Firstly, there's getting rid of arbitrage opportunities. I think that it's obvious that the bookmakers have to remove ARBs. In fact, they make a small profit when they get rid of an ARB. Secondly, they can take arbitrage opportunities. Because the exchange prices are higher than the bookmaker prices, the bookmakers have ARB opportunities. They don't have these opportunities until there's a lot of liquidity in the exchange market. Although the exchange prices are still better than the bookmaker prices when, there's, when there is little liquidity in the market, the bookmakers can't easily ARB a large sum of money without knocking the exchange odds down too low. However, during the five minutes before the race, everything changes. The exchange market has a lot of liquidity. This means that theoretically, a bookmaker could lay a bet on his own website and immediately back the same horse on the exchange as an ARB. Thirdly, they, they might want to control best odds guaranteed. Bookmakers may back a horse's odds down just before the start of a race to avoid paying out too much on best odds guaranteed. This is probably more difficult to do in smaller fields than in larger fields. If they've laid a horse at short odds and it's drifted, they've probably also taken a lot of money on another horse. Therefore, in a small field, they might not be able to back one horse without the odds on the other horse going back up. In addition, they have to do this without creating ARBs. Fourthly, and most importantly, there's value betting. The bookmakers may be players in the exchange markets. In fact, I trade on the principle that the bookmakers are players in the market. In the financial markets, it's generally accepted by day traders that banks and other fina big financial institutions are players in the market. In addition, it's accepted that the big institutions control the markets. In other words, banks gamble on the financial markets. 
Although they probably have an edge, based on information, they can be considered to be plus EV gamblers. Now, if the banks gamble on the financial markets, it's likely that the bookmakers gamble on the sports markets. In fact, if the bookmakers don't have a mathematically perfect book, they are gambling. As I've said, it's important to get away from the limiting belief that, bookmake, that the bookies are risk-averse and are trying to win on every outcome. This belief is a box that you need to think outside of. Understanding what bookmakers do is one of the keys to trading. The bookies probably have more information than anyone. If they know the real value of horses, or close to the real value, value betting and laying should be easy for them. We should aim to think like the bookmakers and piggyback on their market moves. We want a piece of the action. My favourite time to trade is during the last two minutes before the start of a race. We need to get an idea in real life terms of what is occurring during those last two minutes pre-race. At the start of a UK race, there is often upwards of a quarter of a million pounds matched. A lot of this money is matched during the last two minutes before the race. Late gambles on favourites are probably initiated by stables. However, bookmakers might also be involved. Then there's the bounce back. What causes a bounce back? The first question is, where does the sudden surge of money during those last two minutes come from? It's unlikely to be traders because the odds move in a direction and such moves are often permanent. When traders open a trade, this might move the odds in a particular direction. However, when they close their trades, the odds will reverse back. When the odds bounce, they stay at a high level until the off. They may come down just a little bit before the off. However, for a real bounce back, the odds never get close to where they were two minutes before the off. There could be some traders who back the horse before the two-minute pre-race point and then close the trade around two minutes before the off. However, this is unlikely to have such a big influence on the market because the liquidity during the five to two-minute pre-race period is lower than the liquidity at two minutes up to the start of the race. So what about punters? I've heard gurus say that the odds bounce back because they've been back down too low and punters don't want to back the horse any longer. As usual, the guru explanation doesn't make sense. For example, let's say you have a horse that came in from 1.67 to 1.43 and then it bounces back to or above 1.67. Well, when this horse was getting backed on the way down, punters were happy to back it at all the odds between 1.67 and 1.43. So if the punters were prepared to back the horse at all the odds between 1.67 and 1.43 before, why do the odds need to fly up to 1.67 before punters supposedly will take an interest in the horse again? You might be thinking that some punters lay horses and therefore they could be causing the bounce back. Although there are some punters who lay horses, there are nearly as many as those who back horses. You get bounce back it backs in races where the favourite is running its first ever race. Form reading punters who lay horses are never going to find those. I mean, I've heard that there are punters who bet on breeding and how much the horse cost. However, I've ne never met any who would bet only on those two factors. If the sudden surge of money isn't due to traders or punters, this just leaves informed money, that is, stables and bookmakers. The second question is, do the odds move in a particular direction? The answer is yes. You've probably heard the following many times. If you back every favourite 
at the Betfair SP, you will lose. If you lay every favourite at the Betfair SP, you will also lose. I tested this on a website that has a load of past racing data. The sample that I used was 10 years. If I included the 2% commission, my sample lost whether I was backing all horses or laying all horses. Interestingly, when I ran the same test using 0% commission, backing favourites showed a tiny profit, a very tiny profit, while laying favourites showed a tiny loss at Betfair SP. This could be random variation, or favourites could be slightly overpriced at the off. However, what does this tell us? Although the Betfair SP might not be 100% efficient, it's highly efficient. And when I say efficient, I mean that the odds reflect the horse's true probability of winning. There may be a deliberate odds reset taking place during the last two minutes pre-race. If the Betfair SP is highly efficient and the market moves significantly just before the off, it means that the market was relatively inefficient before the market move. This reset involves the odds moving from relatively inefficient towards the highly efficient Betfair SP. Could this be random? Possibly, but it's very unlikely. There's a lot of money at stake for the gambling establishments, for them to allow the markets to run randomly. I work with the theory that there is intelligence behind the big surge of money during the last couple of minutes before the start of the race. Normally, I don't just assume that a large bet is intelligent money. I'm not like the gurus who see a big sum of money on the ladder and assume that it means something. In any gambling game, there are mugs at every stake level. Although there are fewer mugs at higher stakes, big money doesn't necessarily mean intelligent money. However, in the last two minutes before the off, we're talking about a lot of large bets getting matched in a short space of time. And when there are a lot of high-stakes players around, and they're moving the market, it's more likely to represent intelligent money. There are reasons why the bookmakers might want to reset the odds close to the off. One is that there is another market the bookies have to get ready for, namely the in-play market. In-play traders and punters bet on what they see, if the in-play odds start off in the wrong place at the start of the race, the bookmakers may be leaving too much value. If horses that have odds that are too long have a good start, a fast-acting in-play trader or punter might find a good value bet. If any horses that are too short in the betting have a bad start, in-play traders may be able to lay for value. So we know where the odds are going in the last two minutes. We know that they're heading towards efficiency. This correction of odds is not just about the preparation for the in-play market. I'll explain how the bookmakers profit when they correct the odds towards efficiency. However, let's start by asking the question, why was the market inefficient in the first place? Surely the informed money didn't just figure out what the efficient odds were just two minutes before the start of the race. The bookmakers probably don't know what the efficient odds should be overnight or early in the day. They probably build a picture of the race from the form, the overnight and morning betting and any inside information that they've acquired. We can assume this because the night before and on the morning of a race, they often have various favourites odds at much higher or lower odds than they end up at. They probably have accumulated as much information as they're going to get 10 minutes before the race or even one hour before the race. 
I'll talk about information later. We can get information as well. But why do they wait until two minutes before the race to move the odds to efficiency? Well, one answer is because there's more liquidity at two minutes. However, there's another reason that the bookmakers may profit from inefficient odds. That is, they may give inefficient odds deliberately. I'll explain this with an example. Imagine a bookmaker is giving odds on a coin toss. The bookmaker knows that the odds of the coin toss are 50-50. However, in this fictitious example, the punters don't know what the real odds of a coin toss are. In addition, the bookmaker knows that the punters don't know what the real odds are. So the bookmaker puts the odds of heads at 1.99 and the odds of tails at 1.99. As punters bet, is it more profitable for the bookmaker to adjust the odds, or should he just keep the odds fixed at 1.99? In other words, if more punters bet on heads, should he move the odds of heads down and the odds of tails up, or should he just stick with fixed odds at 1.99? And remember to bear in mind that this is a fictitious example in which punters don't know the real odds of a coin toss. Well, we know what happens if he keeps the odds at 1.99. If there's more money bet on heads, he'll lose if the coin lands on heads. However, if tails lands, he will win more than his potential losses on heads. The bookmaker has a small edge, and he'll win in the long run, in a similar way that a casino wins with its fixed odds for roulette. Let's see what happens if the bookmaker reduces the odds of heads and increases the odds of tails, just like they do with horses. And remember, this is because punters are betting heavily on heads and not much on tails. So, over the day, the bookmaker reduces the odds of heads and increases the odds of tails, such that the odds of heads are at 1.7, and the odds of tails are at 2.4. A punter could back tails down to 2.0. If that happened, the bookmaker wouldn't be any worse off than if he'd just kept the odds fixed at 1.99. If the bookmaker has done his maths correctly, he will have given bad odds on heads for a large amount of money, and good odds on tails for a smaller amount of money, and that should balance out. However, the punter who backed tails down will have taken the bookmaker's future profits. And these pro future profits wouldn't be available to the bookmaker if he'd used fixed odds. These future profits are only available because the bookmaker has moved the odds and created an inefficient market. So what are these future profits? Well, let's assume that the punters do not back tails heavily and the odds remain inefficient until two minutes before the coin toss. Imagine that the exchanges are offering odds on the same coin toss. The odds are similar, but perhaps a bit better than the bookmaker's odds. Now, the bookmaker is exposed on heads because of the amount of money that has been waged on heads compared to tails, but he doesn't mind because he has so much money behind him that he can forget about exposure and take value wherever it's available. He will win more when tails lands than his potential losses on heads landing. Therefore, in terms of value, he's on the right side of the bet. Now, the bookmaker, just two minutes before the coin toss, can lay heads on the exchange until the odds reach 2.0. And although he's increasing his exposure on heads, this is all added value. And these are the future profits that I spoke about earlier. In addition, by taking this value, the bookmaker is moving the odds from inefficiency towards an efficient SP. This added value is the second reason that the bookmakers may move horse racing markets from inefficiency towards an efficient Betfair SP, 
The first reason was to get the market ready for in-play traders and punters. So allowing the odds to become inefficient up to two minutes pre-race and then correcting the odds just, just before the off is beneficial for bookmakers in more than one way. And by the way, this is an example is an analogy for the bounce back. And if instead of laying heads, the bookmaker had back tails at the exchange, this would be an analogy for the two minute pre-race heavy backing on a drifter. To predict efficient odds, we need to read form and be aware of the betting activity on horses earlier in the day. I'm talking about two completely different mindsets. The guru's student mindset is to look at the odds. They see the odds are at 1.67. Now the odds are 1.43. Therefore, they assume that the odds have been back too low and are due to go back up. The form reader's mindset would be, uh, would be to ask whether the horse's form justifies 1.43 odds or whether the odds should be higher or lower. The guru's followers make the assumption that the 1.67 odds were in the ballpark. If you've seen enough racing, you'll know that this isn't the case. Sometimes the odds reduce and keep reducing. In this part one of how to read horse racing markets, I explain that there's a reset or a correction of the odds taking place during the last two minutes before the start of a horse race. Therefore, we now know where the market's going. In part two of how to read horse racing markets, I'll discuss form. I'll explain how different form criteria affect my trading decisions. In other words, I won't just reel off a bunch of form variables. I will link form to the market. So that's all for this video. Take care.